Before we jump into the formal session, are there any objections you have or comments about your meeting? Yes. Yes. I think, that I, I think he's made a mistake. That's possible. <laughs> because I don't have my book with me, but I underlined it with a question mark, but it says uh, toward the end of the chapter that we choose God. And uh, my Bible says that God chooses us. Wow. Oh. That's one of the fun things about theology, is there are always more than one point of view, or more than one complementary principle. And what is God's part in our salvation and Christian life? What is our part in it? What is the part of the body? Well, theologies make their mistake when they focus only on one side. You kind of downplay the other. Well, just yesterday, I was in a prayer meeting with some missionaries, and one of them was recently asked to leave his church in Portland because uh, the church teaches that we are such vile sinners, incapable of doing any good, that his expectation that Christians should live a holy life was not acceptable. Anyway, that's the one I understood he was trying to say. But does the scripture have anything to say about living a holy life? Mm -hmm. Quite a lot. We read this morning, God has given us the grace, the promises, the knowledge, everything we need for life and godliness. All right, the unseen world of the Bible. Session 15, Partakers of the Divine Nature, 5th of February. Here are my objectives for me. If you share them, welcome. First, I wonder, I would like to understand better what it means to be saved. Secondly, learn to explain how Jews and Gentiles gain salvation. Is it the same? Were Jews saved by works in the Old Testament? Thirdly, to believe our adoption as God's children. And fourthly, to affirm our destiny as members of God's family council. Remember, you can download the document and the PowerPoint slides from the website. Uh, the theme I take from one sentence, we are and will be God's new divine council. We've already been made members. Now, this idea of a divine council was not invented by Dr. Heiser, the author of our book, uh, nor is it unique to the Bible. In fact, most ancient societies had some kind of a belief, even back in Sumer, five, four, down to the second millennium before Christ, they had such a belief. And they even had inscriptions and carvings. So you have here an example, the god Shamash, the sun god, from the ninth century BC, showing him on his throne with gods and kings gathered around him. An old Babylonian, second millennium BCE, they had their divine council. Ancient Egypt, all through its many millennia, had teachings about the gods getting together and sometimes inviting humans. And Canaanite, a religion into which from which the Hebrews emerged and eventually returned, and uh, in particular, uh, the city state of Ugari learned to, uh, learned to read their language uh, some years ago, uh, talked about the gods getting together, making decisions about what to do with the humans on Earth. Neo-Babylonia, the last of the captivity of the uh, Judea, for example, same kind of uh, beliefs. And of course, the Hebrews and the Israelites from at least the second and first millennium BCE understood that the great creator God, Yahweh, had a council of angelic spirit beings 
with whom he consulted, didn't need their advice, but he invited them to participate in the decisions about things on earth. What is it to which we have been saved? What is it that God has in store for us? We're saved from God's wrath. As from God's wrath unto heaven. His service. His service. His family. The family. Yes. Family. 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 Uh, interesting Bible study. Maybe we could do a lesson at the end of this on what is in store for us. If by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can buy. Wonderful verse. We all have memorized this. Great comfort to us. But the one thing this verse doesn't tell us is what you say is. What it leads to, where it's going. It's just that we didn't earn it. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. All right. In the case of the Philippian jailer, saved from what? Yeah. So, saying that family, five children, yeah. seven people, so my wife, a Christian, yeah. does that mean we're all saved? Without, without repenting and believing? Well, yeah. Or what about... Oh, no, so that's probably a trick question. It's a trick question. But it's, a, it's a good trick. It requires an answer, which we don't have time to deal with here today. That's fine. All right. You know, Galen likes to say shocking things. It's a, it's a personality <laughs> effect. But where in the Bible does it say that we go to heaven? Well, what about the second... Jesus didn't say you'd be in heaven with us? No. Go back and look at it. Paradise. 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 Okay. Well, what's the difference? Ah, there's the difference. And um, is that the same as paradise in heaven? I'm going to leave that as an open question for right now. How about now. the depiction of uh, fallen martyrs in the book of Revelation being before the heavenly throne? Right. Yeah. There's no question that we have access into the heavens. But the Bible never says, we go to heaven when we die. So the Revelation is it's an eschatological future perspective. So, uh, so now that asks the body of the Lord. It's the Lord in that case. Is that up in heaven, or is it in paradise, or is it his Judging his presence, he has a left hand, and he's still sitting at the right hand. <laughs> okay. See, what you're delving in right now is logic, <laughs> not scripture. Also, it is legitimate to employ logic in understanding scripture. But my point, the point I'm going to lead up to here is going to heaven, whatever that means, isn't our ultimate destiny. No, ultimate destiny. We have a hand in the words. So let's talk just a moment about the theology of salvation in the Latin speaking Western countries, which included most of Europe for some time. And theologians and pastors, even ourselves, trying to fit the pieces together, have come up with a lot of the elements that go into our being rescued from death and into eternal life. One of these is election, God's choosing of us. There's always a discussion of when does that happen? Before you the creation, or before you believe, or after you believe. Then there is the doctrine of creation. God had to actually make us, so there's something to live in to be saved. Conviction, when the Holy Spirit somehow operates on our minds to recognize our need, understand what God is offering us, then leading to enlightenment, meaning, oh, now I understand. And then regeneration, when God actually does something to transform our spirit so that we are now somehow connected with his spirit. 
in a way that was not true before. Then there's <clears throat> what recreation. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. creation. And there's conversion, kind of a covered term, but we change not only spiritually, but socially, mentally, we become followers of Jesus. Then there's adoption. Adoption is when some, somehow God brings us into his new family that he is building. Any of you here adopted? Oh, okay. Did that work out for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've met my bio family, and I got to better deal. <laughs> I'm adopted as well. Sorry? I'm adopted. All right, that's right. Okay, very good. <laughs> Uh, we never adopted, but we did keep um, children for a while who were in the U.S. for medical needs. Then there's sanctification, some kind of process whereby God works on our character, making us more deep like Jesus. Then there's maturation. Just to, you can believe all the right doctrines and still be very undisciplined in our, in, in our behavior. Over time we become more mature, more consistent. And then there's endowment. By this I mean the distribution of the spirit, gifts of the Spirit to all believers. And employment. God puts us to work in the family. And that's worth a lot of joy in that. And of course reproduction. Communities in which we belong to Jesus Christ, they do draw others. They do reproduce through their testimony. Uh, Do you know I coach some missionaries uh, by Zoom, and their last report this week was was quite astounding. Uh, Thai people coming, asking for baptism. And learning the gospel, and starting, this last week they started two new little churches with new believers. They're reproducing. And it was these new Thai believers who drew the others. Then there's perseverance. We don't give up right away. We don't stop. We don't, we don't lose it all. We keep on going. There's translation. The time will come when we will be completely renewed. This will happen at resurrection. We don't give up living in bodies. We get new bodies. And transformation. Our character. And what we're like at the resurrection won't be the same. All of the desires that keep dragging us back and holding us down, they will be replaced with new desires. Some call this glorification. When we become worthy of all of the honor of the children of the living God. In our character, in our body, in our tasks. And then so this is, there's exaltation. We go up. There's a new rank. We become not only earthly, we also become heavenly beings as well. And there's revelation. This is when all of creation finally recognizes who we are as the real children of God. The world around us just considers us backward, ignorant uh, trumpers. (laughs) <laughs> and of course, we're familiar with the scripture that the verses that say we were saved, others we have been saved, or we are being saved, and at the return of Jesus we shall be saved. Now, saved from what? Well, to understand this, as we've already read in our book, how conditions were before the great flood? Come on, read. So the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. And the sons of God went to die in the and had children. Um, 
Okay, if you come to the men's group this Thursday, we're going to explain the verse. But what's the point we want to make here? Is in our past history, things got really bad. And somehow the human race was being contaminated or corrupted, perhaps even at the level of genetics, the DNA, by spirit beings who were having children through women, I don't know how they did it, may have been some kind of DNA manipulation, when the so-called sons of God, I take it that means spirit beings, were defiling the race to the point where so the Lord saw how great the witness of the human race had become like this. Right. So that was the conclusion. Our race had become exceedingly wicked, unbelieving, following after spirit beings. According to Jewish literature, it was those spirit beings who taught women how to paint themselves to become seductive and taught men how to make weapons and go to war. And even to the point where the Nephilim began eating each other and eating human beings. In the well, first slide, you had like 4,500 to like uh, 600 BCE. Right. So would that fit into that 4,500 year range? Is that before that? Or you know? I don't know. Okay. So my wife is a young Earth creationist. She knows all of the proofs and arguments and evidences. She could answer that for you. Someone else in this room may have a different view. Okay. As you may be aware, if you watch uh, Netflix and YouTube very much, there is a lot of discovery going on around the Earth in this present decade, finding the existence and the remains of very ancient civilizations. Some of them dated to 10,000, 12,000, 15, and 17,000 BC. Of course, there, there are always problems with dating schemes. They're based on presuppositions, usually in some kind of a circular logic. We know the flood occurred. Humans were told to spread through the earth and refused to do it. And so we had the Babel event and what followed. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. When the humans, even after the flood, decided that they were not interested in obeying Yahweh's explicit commands, he decided to let them go their own way, but not without controls. And so he assigned to each ethnic community a spirit guide whom those communities began to recognize and worship as their gods, but with a big exception. Oh, let me stop here for a moment. If anyone asked you, Christians, what's the cause of the human condition? Why is it that we are so bent towards destroying each other and abusing each other? Where did that all start? What's the standard answer? The fall, meaning the human disobedience. If, however, you were to ask any Jew who knows the Hebrew Bible, how do you guys explain the human condition? Where did, how did we get like this? What would their answer be? Genesis. The devil and the evil spirits and the gods over the nations that corrupted themselves. And part of that, of course, was deceiving us and we fell as well. Is either of those responses, the Christian or the Jewish, better? They're both right. Just They're both right. Chronologically, one would precede the other. Right. Well, it depends. Yeah, okay, but don't go, go there. <laughs> For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, Israel, his allotted inheritance. Right. So, right from the time of Babel, God chose one particular family which became an ethnicity eventually, through whom he was going to preserve for himself a people. That would be his inheritance. 
In other words, God keeps Israel, lets the rest of the nations go. However, in the, as the story continues, eventually Gentiles become part of Israel. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham, his family, and his descendants, they remain the unique people of God. But right from the start, there's this great promise, which is referenced throughout the scriptures and even into the New Testament. That great promise that the Gentiles will be rescued eventually from their gods and brought into this new family called Israel. Now, did all Israelites remain faithful to Yahweh? No. no. Do you suppose they got saved, whatever that means anyway? No. Salvation, whatever it is, is always been by grace through faith alone. Well, we go on then into the New Testament. Israel has experienced a hardening in part so the total number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Uh, the full number of the Gentiles, does that mean all of them? No. No. Apparently, God has some number in mind. Uh, or all who will, but come in. The Gentiles have come in into what? Yeah. The family. And the family in this text is called Israel. Israel. And so all Israel will be saved, meaning all Jews who have believed in Yahweh and remained loyal to him, along with all Gentiles who, through faith in Messiah Jesus, remain faithful to him, they likewise have come into the family called Israel. You mean all those who were predestined to come in? All believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have been predestined to be glorified with his Son. All right, salvation then is to become God's children. One, by faith in Israel's Messiah. His own Israel did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Were there some Israelites who received Jesus as Messiah? Yes. 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 Did the nation receive him as king? No. No. Did most of their political leaders receive him as their Lord? No. 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 However, many thousands did receive him and heard the gospel on the day of Pentecost and went back to the nations and carried the message with them. It's one of the reasons that Bible translation is so important, so that when you go to evangelize and plant churches in a community, there are already there those who have some notions of the true God. Secondly, by receiving God's Holy Spirit, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Okay, there it is. Yeah, it's receiving the Holy Spirit. This is the essential, at least the start of salvation, by faith in Messiah Jesus, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, and signifying that by water baptism, True Israel consists in all of God's children. Hmm. Through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Right. The promise. Which promise are we talking about? Remember, we, look, we have Gentiles, we have Israel, one body. So what promise is it? Promise Yahweh made to Abraham that all nations would be blessed. So in Christ Jesus, you are 
all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There we are. Yeah, well stated. Well read. Well, do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Yes. 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 But is that biblical language? No. It's emotional language. That people can feel, and it's very encouraging to them. We do use non-biblical language. But we are now all children of God through faith. We have joined the family. All right, here are some weak views towards Israel that I have heard over the years amongst Bible-believing Christians. I just think are not sufficient. First, Yahweh is done with Israel because it failed. No. Oh, what about what about when you and I fail? Is he done with us? <laughs> not. Uh, others have suggested Israel was only an example to teach Christians. So when we read the Old Testament, we just see if that's the way God deals with people. So leave that alone now. Come over to the New Testament and see how he deals with us. What's God's dealing with Israel? An example. Yes. Yeah, right now. Mm -hmm. But much more. Then others say, well, Israel predicted the Messiah and then went apostate and left the faith. So it's up to now the, uh, the new Israel, some call it the church, to uh, remain faithful. Some have suggested, well, Israel was temporary, just waiting for Messiah to come. And now that Messiah has come, Israel is kind of like an old, the old car that you don't put in the garage anymore. You drive the new car. But the old one's there if you need. I'd like to suggest some better views towards Israel. One is that Yahweh has an eternal plan to glorify Israel. Secondly, Israel remains Yahweh's children, his inheritors. Everything that he is preparing for all the future, it's ours. Israel includes faithful Jews and Gentiles alike. And then Israel is becoming Yahweh's new divine council. Many of the spirit beings who were in this council have gone bad. Uh, others have remained faithful to him. And we, he wants to include humans in the divine council, just as Adam initially was back in Eden. Jesus is Yahweh's appointed inheritor. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. When he says our ancestors, we now know that this letter is addressed to whom? Hebrews. Primarily, the Jewish Christians. The Old Testament talked about the last days. They've now come. When did they start? The last days started with the birth of Jesus Christ. Or it would be for with his resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that's different from the end times or the end of days. And then we learn from this verse a couple of important things about this one who's called the Son. He is both creator of the physical universe. He is also the inheritor of the physical universe. He created it perfect. It has fallen under the dominion of demons and is, has to be renewed in the future. But as such, Jesus already possesses Yahweh's glory. That is, all of the honor that is due to him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory <clears throat> and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty and the <clears throat> Okay, unpack that a bit. What do you observe that you think is particularly um, astounding or important? 
at representation. You see Jesus, you understand him, you understand the Father. All things are sustained by Jesus. Leading it towards its eventual glorification by his powerful word, his commands. Yeah, purification, forgiveness, and removal of our sins. And then where is he now? Let's go back up to that word radiance. He is the radiance of God's glory. I didn't realize this till I looked it up. I have a, some software that will show me every word and every phrase in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. Every place in all of the Bible and the Apocrypha and a lot of ancient literature. Researchers have only found this is where this Greek word is only used twice. One in the Book of Wisdom. Oh, where is that, by the way? The Book of Wisdom. It's in the Apocrypha. Do we believe the Apocrypha? Not in the same sense as can canon of Scripture. Right. Catholics still include the Apocrypha in their Bible, and Protestants used to have it there as well. But along the way, we uh, we moved on. But a lot of the biblical language, both Old and New Testaments, has their first usage in the Apocrypha. And in Wisdom 7.6, it is a poem of praise and worship towards the wisdom of God, who is now personified in Jesus. The glory, then, this is a term that means deserving of honor. And he's the representation, meaning he's the visible, tangible presence of the divine nature or reality, which of course awe is invisible. And the majesty, I take it to be the invisible father. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. All right. So that which Jesus Christ now is, we are to become. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Mm -hmm. um, does verse 30 pose any grammatical difficulty for you? Past tense. The English translation, every one of those verbs is a past tense. What about the last one, he also glorified? Does that mean it's already happened? Mm -hmm. Some theologians say, well, in the mind of God it has, but of course in our experience it hasn't happened yet. There is a verb tense in Greek that has no time attached to it. Arrows. Called the arrows. First, conformed, literally morphed with, to share in his glory. Uh, we become brothers and sisters, means adopted into the family, glorified, and eras verbs have no time element. And so when you find these eras in the Greek New Testament, and you're translating into a language like ours, you have to assign a verb, a tense to it. I think our translators did us a disservice by keeping everything in the past tense. But you could very legitimately translate it a little differ differently. Those uh, whom he predestined, he also called them. Those, or he's calling them. And those whom he's calling, well, he will also justify those. And those who get justified, he will someday glorify them. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> We're not yet soaring with the eagles, so we're down here with the turkeys. <laughs> we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We know there's a future glorification, but it hasn't begun yet. Yeah. Yeah, it has begun. This is why you former alcoholics are now dry. Uh, you former thieves, you now work and give to the poor. The transformation has become. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inward as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the sonship, the 
Are you dead or wise? Uh, didn't we read a verse earlier that says that we have been adopted or received the adoption? Some of those are aristenses. The time is not indicated. Only the truth is indicated. But we who have received the Holy Spirit, so there's also a future to adoption. In other words, um, are you and I already ruling over the world? Not in fact, perhaps in, in our uh, attitudes or in our prayers, in our hopes, or in our theology, but no, we're, we're still sitting here around tables, growing old. <laughs> we wait not to go bodiless into a vague ethereal heaven, but we wait to receive our new body. That's what we're looking forward to. No, absent from the body, present from the Lord. That's a evangelicalism. So this morning I sat and thought, what other evangelicalisms do we are present in our churches that would be hard to prove by the Bible? Ask Jesus in your heart. That's one. I didn't think of that one. I put down here, accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Well, what does it really mean? Become a follower of Jesus. Become a follower when we put our trust and hope into the Lord Jesus Christ, something like that. But my Jewish friend one asked me, accept Jesus, why? What's wrong with him? Here's another one. You go to heaven when you die. You really have to uh, define what you mean by heaven. That's exactly, yeah, right. And, but it is a useful term that kind of includes everything the Bible talks about. But we need, we have a one word cliche for that. Here's another one. Once saved, always saved. That settles every argument, doesn't it? <laughs> that might be true, but... Uh, all right, baptism is a public testimony. Well, it can be, yeah. if there's a public standing around. <laughs> I've been in some baptisms where you didn't dare do them in public. You would be beaten immediately and held down in the mud until the police arrived to carry you away. That raises the question, should it be done then? <laughs> yes, in obedience to Jesus Christ, it has to be done. Well, baptism, of course, is much more than that. Communion is only a remembrance. Well, yeah, we do it in remembrance of Jesus, not in remembrance of the Paschal Lamb. But is it anything else? Well, I think it's a lot more. Let's see. Church is a hospital for sinners. <laughs> I kind of like it, don't we? Yeah. Now, the world itself has its cliches that answer every question and stop every argument. Again, you don't need any logic or evidence as long as you know the phrase. Here's one. Safe and effective. <laughs> Safe. Systemic racism. That answers, that answers all social problems. No matter how false it might be. Yeah. <laughs> Climate change. Cultural construct. Everything you believe is just formed by your culture. We who have academic degrees, we know the truth. Because they have open minds. They're not biased at all. Oh, here's my mind. Toxic masculinity. <laughs> No toxic feminine, for sure. <laughs> and here's what I really hate. War with, Ch War with China by 2025. These cliches, every one of them, there's some truth behind them. Are there toxic men? Yeah, we can stick most of them in prison. So, we're going into the new divine council. And bringing many sons and daughters to glory. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. Uh, the Hebrew term for assembly is the same one that's translated elsewhere. The Council of the Gods. 
And so what is this great assembly that's coming? Jesus Christ will be the Lord of heaven and earth with his brothers and sisters. Who are they? Oh, yeah. All of you who love him now. This is your destiny. You are to rule nations well, along with the Lord Jesus Christ in a great... Uh, there is a new world order coming, folks. I yeah. don't mean the one that Klaus Schwab is dreaming of. Yeah. So I take it that the assembly here is Yahweh's great family. family. Now, the book, the chapter, was taken from this verse, Partakers of the Divine Nature. But as I read through these verses again and again in three translations, it makes pretty clear to me that it's, it's actually saying we already, in this life, begin partaking of the divine nature as we mature and become more godly in our manner of life. But it won't stop now with us. It will go on into the far future. As we have become and will be partakers of the divine nature. It's hard to be the imagine of what it is, except that we've gotten a few victories over time, over the years. All right, the Greek here says to become companions, partners, sharers. The term divine, theos, sounds like another word that you know, theos, mm -hmm. which means God. And then, of course, the divine nature, we will be new creatures and start to My concluding suggestion here is that our salvation includes much more than just to stay out of hell. That may be a pretty good place to start. <laughs> Or to attend a church service as potlucks and prayer meetings. I never look forward to any of those, but of course when I get there, it turns out to be better than I appeared. I try to be good all the time. Well, we ought to be trying to be good all the time, but or just bemoaning the evil deeds of the wicked. Nor is it just voting for conservative or liberal candidates, depending on which Christian denomination you're in, or which Bible school you attend, or just waiting for a rapture that never comes. I didn't say it won't come, but we're still waiting. Or is it just dread, to dread going to heaven? You really look forward to it? You really want to sing hymns forever? <laughs> I mean, we had some wonderful old songs this morning. They were singable. <laughs> That's an old guy talking. <laughs> um, keep looking for the reading your Bible in light of the divine counsel. Chapter 16, our final week, ruling over angels. Hope that we'll, this idea will no longer seem quite as puzzling as it may have in the past.